Still talking about the fifth step of the scientific method when you analyze the data, once you know that the data is trustworthy, you've checked the validity of the data, and you know the extent to which the data can be trusted, now you're going to try to understand this data. What is the data saying about the hypothesis? Can I reject the hypothesis, or did I fail to reject this hypothesis? The very first thing you need to do when you're doing that is you have to visualize the data. And this is something scientists often do with charts, graphs, tables, maps, things of the sort. Now here you see an example of a data table where you set up uh, the, the variables and all the different things you want to know about it. So tables like this is what you want to do, but notice that this is very important. This is a major rule about it. You're always going to include table headers, table titles, uh, units in everything that you do because it's important to be uh, give as much information as you can. So units, headers, and titles for table columns and rows need to always be included when you put data in a table. Always have a table uh, in when you're trying to look at your data because it's the best way to see the patterns. And then you can also have uh, perform what we call statistics. Now, statistics is when you compute the, the, the data. So you do math analysis to see if the results are significant. And sometimes, uh, for example, you want to find if you're comparing a group to groups and you'll see if there's a, a difference that exists between the groups. Uh, let's say, for example, you're measuring uh, to see if an enzyme is actually spitting up the chemical reaction. So you measure the reaction with the enzyme 100 times, and you measure without the enzyme 100 times, and you get the average time of both groups, and you want to compare them. You need to do statistics to determine whether or not the results that, that occurred were because there truly is a difference between the groups, or is it because chance made that happen, you know? So statistics exist to calculate the probability of your results being due to chance or due to a real effect that you're actually testing. In other words, your chance that the hypothesis was rejected or failed to be rejected because of chance rather than because the data is actually showing what you want to show. Now, for the purpose of a, of a high school science class, you will never probably get that far unless you get into AP, AP statistics class. But I want you to know that in real science, it doesn't stop at creating a graph or creating a table. J the pattern that seems to be real has to be tested mathematically to, so, so that you can say beyond a doubt that the pattern truly has a presence that is not due to chance alone. And that's when you calculate things like ranges, critical values, devi standard deviation, uh, bias, uh, uh, Type 1 error, type 2 error, outcome, variance, uh, means, modes, uh, correlation, probabilities. All of these numbers that are you learn about when you take a statistics class. Okay? The next step for the scientist would be to explain this data with words and to describe with words what the graphs and charts and the statistics are all saying. And all of these three things need to be included when you're actually writing a lab report. And we'll talk about that uh, in a different video lecture series. Now, I want to spend some time talking about the different kinds of graph that you're going to see throughout the year. This is a bar graph. And notice that any graph, you're going to have to have a title. You're going to have to have headers for each of the variables, units for each of the variables included on the graph. So notice that, for example, here you have season. And you have numbers to represent that, that thing. And then you have points, and then you have the points listed there, the units as well. And then you have a title. Bar graphs, the best thing for bar graphs is to compare frequencies or averages across different groups. So as you can see here, this is what they're using this for. They're using a bar graph to compare teams across different years and compare their averages. So, and they obviously also, another thing I forgot to mention, they have a legend so you can tell you what the things mean in a graph. So graphs should always have the title, the headers, the units, and the, the legend. So when you design a graph, and you're going to have to do this for the class, make sure that you have those features always on the graph. Um, all right, so bar graph to compare different groups in terms of frequencies or averages. All right, so circle graphs or pie charts. This one is to calculate the percent distribution of data. So you see here they're comparing, let's say they ask people in the survey, um, among these four months, which one is your favorite? And you can see that in the data, 
the choice of, of the people that August would prevail because it has a bigger piece of the chart. So this is to show you percent distribution on a population. It is very uh, common when you have groups, uh, a whole, being split into parts, and you want to show how much of each part makes up the whole. That's what that graph is for. You also have line graphs. Now, line graphs are, or data point plots are to show patterns in the data over time or between the two variables, right? So you see, for example, uh, that you would have to have labels on the axis. You're going to have to you have units on both axes. You have to have a title. And you, if you had more than one line, you would have to have a, a, a legend as well. But what this line graph is showing you is the pattern that exists between the two variables on, on the graphs, right? So this is exactly what, uh, what you see over here. Now, you could still use a line graph to compare uh, the patterns over time. Let's say, for example, you want to compare group green with group blue. And maybe group blue started higher but ended up lower. So you see you're comparing to groups. So do you know how I said the bar graphs are the best way to compare to groups? True. But you can also do the same thing with a line graph. Line graphs are better if you're doing change over time. So uh, if you're doing multiple measurements, line graphs is the way you probably want to go. They're neater than a bar graph would be uh, in this case. You can see the pattern a lot better. Now, I want to take a pause here to talk about the, how you put the variables in the graph. This is very important. Let's say, for example, I want to see how the, the height of children changes over time. So that means that... Uh, I'm measuring the height, right? So that's my dependent variable, the thing that I'm measuring. That should go on my y-axis, and then the independent variable should go on my x-axis. There's a little trick to remember this. It's called dry mix. If you remember dry mix, you will never get mixed up, all right? Because look at this. The dependent variable, which is the responding variable, goes in the y-axis. See how cool that is? Now, the independent variable, which is the variable that you manipulate, goes in the x-axis. If you do it that way, you will never get in trouble. So, and remember that the label for that axis needs to be the, the variable itself. So, if my independent variable was time, that's what I labeled that with. And then I should have units of time here. Let's say maybe uh, seconds and the numbers that I have. And then you should have the units of height, say, for example, uh, inches or whatever you're measuring it in and you have the units over there. And then you have a title for it, uh, growth over time, and you have uh, uh, a legend if you have more than one line and you have to differentiate between them. So there you go, that's how you set up a graph and I hope that you understand that. Now those were the most important graphs to know about. The ones I'm gonna show you now are additional ones that may show up as you go into your science career and it's good for you to, to know the difference between them. Now that inc includes the graphs that you use to show distributions of data. A histogram is a, it's kind of like um, when you ask a bunch of people uh, and you see their scores on something. And now you want to show you how they distribute, how many people have a score of 25, how many people have a score of 5. So this is to show you f frequency distribution among one group of people that was measured. And this particular pattern that you see here is called a normal curve. It's normal for people to gather or there are more people around the average and to have less people away either above or below the average. So this is what the histogram is showing you, is how many people are present at each of the, those numbers. In other words, the reason why there's more that's higher in the middle is because the score 18 is the most common score. So there's more people in that, in that stack, the frequency distribution is better here. So uh, bar, it's, it's a special type of bar graph that shows you the distribution of the data. Another interesting frequency graph is what you call the OGIV graph. Now what this is showing you here is that it's not really a line graph, it's showing you the frequency of data just like the histogram was showing you. But unlike the other kind of thing that we, when you had a normal distribution, in this case there's more people with, uh, uh, with a score of 46 than with a score of 16. And so you see a pattern that there's more towards people that way than this way. Uh, the graph we saw before was more like this, right? So you could have had an OGIV graph to show you the same thing that the, 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 the histogram shows you. It's basically doing a frequency distribution with a line instead of doing it with a with the thing. Look, you can do turning this into an OGIV graph by tracing a line to represent 
the distribution of, of the of the data and then you have to sh to have an access here that sh tells you uh this means 30 people this means 25 people and this means so forth you know so uh if you trace the outline of a histogram you basically get an ogive graph and an ogive graph is showing you on the on the y axis here the 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 count of how many times the score on the x axis is showing up all right so this is to show you frequency distributions as well then you have the scatter plot the scatter plot is basically when you doing correlational studies for example and you're measuring for example look at this i want to compare if there's a relationship between the age of the husband and the age of the wife so you measure uh, the, you plot this data for example let's say uh, this husband here for example was around 54 years old and his wife was around 44 years old so you plot that point over there and you plot all the points in the graph and then you and then you're going to create what is called a pattern you can see that there's a pattern in this data and we talked about this with the correlational studies you can even trace what is called a line of best fit or the regression line over here and this can be, can be calculated mathematically and then you can use this slope here it will determine how strong the correlation is uh, or what's the number of the correlation this is probably going to be a positive correlation in this case because the graph is going up and it's going to be a pretty strong correlation because all the numbers are close to the line you don't have really outliers all over the place you know numbers which are not fitting the pattern very well so that means it's going to be a strong correlation in the positive direction and then you also have to see if this correlation is significant and that uh, we talked about this with the correlational graphs but scatter plots are very common when you're doing correlational studies and you want to see how two things uh, are related you also have uh, a box and whisker plot and now this is to show you the statistical distribution of the data is to show you the maximum value the minimum value the 75th percentile the 25th percentile and the mean and also the median now these are all statistical points obviously the maximum value you, you would put a number here let's say this is 500 and this is like zero and this would be the minimal value on the scale like this is the lowest score you got from everybody that tested this is the highest score you got from everybody that tested this score here was higher than 75 percent of the people this score here was higher than only 25 percent of the people this is the middle of the score the medians the 50 percentile 50 percent of the people were above it 50 percent of the people were below it and this is the mean the, the average score all right so what this will tell you is how spread out the data is and 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 how uh the maximum it's basically a, a representation of the distribution of the data as the same kind of thing you're trying to do with the histogram or the ogiv graph right so it's so called a box box and whisker plot uh for the data we might i might ask you to do this for some experiments if we have uh, experiments where we calculate multiple numbers this is a stem and leaf plot and what it's doing is also showing the distribution of the data basically each of these numbers in the middle represents a, a, a decimal so for example 20 30 40 and so forth so on the right side here I'm sh it's showing you that I have no one that scored on the 20s but I have some at 32 at 35 at 38 and at 39 when I get to the 50s, I'll see that I have a 50, a 50, a 51, a 51, a 51, a 54, a 55, a 58, another 58, another 59, and a 59. So this is telling you how many times people scored in the 50s. But notice that the group in the left score lower because there's more people scoring towards the bottom end there. And while the group on the right even had people scoring in the 110s. Yeah, right? So you see, this is what the stem and leaf plot is about. And when you take statistics class, they actually teach you how to set one of these up. This is a video is just showing you an overview of what each of the graphs is for. And again, this one, just like the histogram and the OGIV graph, is to show you the distribution of scores that exist. And you can even do this to compare two different groups. Notice that they're comparing someone in the left with someone in the right here. So that's analyzing data. And the next step will be about conclusions. See you guys then.